Welcome to Why I Quit, a show that covers real people quitting their nine to five jobs in search of something different. Listen to inspiring conversations where we dive deep into the stories of why people quit their jobs, what were the hardest parts, where are they now, and any advice for people following the same path. We are so excited to introduce James Tierney as this week's guest on Why I Quit. Listen as James discusses his story of turning his passion for education into starting his own tutoring business right out of grad school. Learn how his love of improv during college turned into launching his own group called Happy Valley Improv. Get inspired hearing how James practices what he preaches to his entrepreneurship students. This enabled him to quit his full-time job as a professor to scale his multiple businesses. Hey, James, thanks so much for joining me today. Of course, I'm happy to be here. Awesome. Well, I'm excited to hear about your story. If you don't mind starting out, giving me a little bit of a background about where you're from and your education background as well. Yeah, I grew up in way upstate New York, about 40 minutes south of Montreal, so right on the Canadian border. A small town, only a few thousand residents called Champlain, New York. I went to a very small high school. It's only about 112 graduating seniors my year. Uh, I was, I'm a first generation college student, so I was, I was pushed very hard by my parents to go to college, uh, and I did. Uh, I went to Western New England College, now it's Western New England University, which means I have two degrees randomly at my house because I changed the name after I graduated. <laughs> and there I, I ended up majoring in math and economics, so I was a double major, and ended up going out to graduate school. So really my entrepreneurial start uh, didn't really happen until I got out to California uh, at UC Irvine, which is where I entered my PhD program for economics. So I was going to do a PhD. I ended up leaving UC Irvine after two and a half years with my master's degree. I took a terminal master's degree and opened up a tutoring business. So I really have always wanted to do education, really loved education, really loved learning, really loved mentoring, working with students. I always knew I wanted to be a teacher. So I, I, in undergrad, I always was a TA when I could be. I did grading. I did, you know, side private tutoring through Craigslist. Uh, so I knew that's what I wanted to do. And when I was in grad school, I wasn't getting that. So I really just built it myself. So did that. That went fairly well. After a few years of it, uh, I really wanted a little more stability. I thought that's what I wanted. Uh, so my uh, fiance at the time, my current wife, uh, and I decided to start looking for full-time economics teaching jobs for myself. Found one in Plattsburgh, New York, which is only 20 minutes away from my family. Figured this is a great opportunity to move back near my family, take a more stable position did that for just a year and a half. My wife from Southern California moved to upstate New York and said, no, this is way too cold. And we ended up in State College, Pennsylvania, which is where I'm here now. Uh, for seven and a half years, I worked with Penn State University as an economics instructor. During that time, well, I'm sure we'll get into it a lot. I was running an improv theater and thinking about my next venture uh, until I quit my job, which I believe is why I'm here today. December 31st, 2021. To go back a little bit, tell me about your kind of thought process at the time. Were you ever entrepreneurial? Was that a plan or did the tutoring business just kind of like fall into place based on that? Or, you know, was the, the overall plan always to go into teaching? So as I was growing up, I always had this entrepreneurial bug my friends and I would always have business plans. And it always ended up being something that I was very interested at the time. So my dad used to run a bowling alley. So I remember my friends, Drew and Alan and I used to sketch like what our bowling alley would be if we were to open our own, you know, kind of like innovative, like what if you had bowling lanes that like went in a star shape and everyone was in the middle. Uh, so we would always fool around with ideas that way. Uh, also, when I was uh, in high school, I used to collect hockey cards. And so I remember in middle and high school, like pricing out all my hockey cards and like dreaming about opening up a, a card and collectible shop. And I never acted on any of those things, but it was always in the, it was always in the back of my mind. And so when, when I went to graduate school and I knew that what I wanted to do was do teaching, 
and I couldn't get a full-time teaching job at the time because it was the middle of the recession, I decided, well, let's go through the process. Let's do a sole prop. Let's do it all officially so I learn about it. That's something we'll probably talk about a lot here. I, I put a lot of value on doing things just to learn about them because I could have simply just put ads out on Craigslist and only accepted cash payments and did it all under the table. A lot of you know tutoring and economic or uh, education consulting stuff is done that way. You know, you meet with a kid for SATs, they give you, you know, 500 bucks, thousand bucks, you just take it as income or, you know, spend the cash somewhere else. But I really wanted to learn about what does it mean to start a business? What does it mean to file taxes? What does it mean to hire uh, an attorney to make contracts? So I invested a lot into, into that. And tell me a little bit about your, your experience in that first business. You know, I know you were started looking for some more stability, so you ended up going into the full-time teaching role, but like, what was the biggest thing you learned during that experience? And then, you know, how was it kind of like leaving, controlling your own schedule and like having full autonomy to kind of going back into the teaching world? What was that experience like for you as well? So I never fully left teaching because I was teaching part-time with some community colleges. And whenever I do something, I, I, I try and do it as, as, as well as possible. I don't try and cut corners. So I, I kept getting, you know, rewarded, quote unquote, with more opportunities to teach. So it turned into me basically teaching four to six sections of intro to economics at two to three different community colleges, and which ends up being basically a full-time job, and then also trying to do the tutoring business. I never really gave it a shot, which is something we'll probably talk about of why I'm doing what I'm doing now. The stuff that I learned from back then is one, giving yourself a shot. Like, how do you sit down and say, okay, I know that I'm not going to make money this year. And how do I accept that? How do I take on debt? May it be through investors? May it be through family? May it be just through 0% credit cards? Uh, you know, not advising that, but it's a, it's a possibility. But the second thing that I really didn't do then, which I'm trying to do a lot better now, is keeping contact management systems much more up to date and using a lot more tools to make sure that my marketing is a lot better, making sure that my communication with current, potential, future, former clients uh, is a lot more pointed. And that really hurt me when I went to sell the business because like I had a decent brand and I had some assets, but you know, the biggest asset I could have had, and you know, maybe I should have went through and went through every single email and pulled it all out. But if I had a client list and a parent list and everything down to the T of this is how old their kid is, and this is what classes they're in, and this is what major they have, you know, that would have made the, the sale of the company uh, a heck of a lot easier and, and much more profitable. Getting into, you know, kind of moving and going full-time into teaching, were you just focused on that at the time or were you still dabbling in other side ventures or what did, what did that look like? That first semester, it was only focusing on teaching full-time. I was teaching a class, intermediate macroeconomics, that I'd never taught before. My fiance was in Southern California, finishing her grad degree. Uh, so it was a, a time where I was living with my parents, driving 20 minutes each way every day to work and really just focusing on that. I did at that time become the faculty advisor for the improv group on SUNY Plattsburgh's campus. And, and through that, I did start teaching small classes in Plattsburgh for improv, doing a couple of workshops. Uh, it was nothing that was official. You know, uh, the most official it became was a Facebook page that was North Country Improv. But I wasn't really thinking about doing anything, uh, any new ventures at that point. And tell me a little bit about one, how you got into improv and then two, you know, in terms of like the business and the entrepreneurship side, are there things that you take from improv that kind of help in your business as well? Oh yeah, absolutely. So in undergrad at Western New England College, it was my third year there, started my third year. And as a liberal arts student, you need to take an art. So the only two that fit in my schedule were improv comedy and paper making. So paper making just didn't seem as interesting to me as improv theater, improv comedy. So I took improv theater as just kind of a theater class and I absolutely fell in love with it. I've always been a comedy fan, 
So I've always enjoyed Saturday Night Live, stand-up comedy. Uh, at that time, I was doing a little bit of stand-up comedy through some local university groups. But the improv really just stuck. So I took the second, you know, the, the second 15 weeks, I took improv two as well, joined the, uh, the improv group on campus, which is called Improv on the Rocks, formed our own group called the Pterodactyl Squad, where we performed in a couple of festivals. And I really, really enjoyed theater, improv theater and comedy uh, specifically. So when I went to decide what I wanted to do with my life in 2008, so graduating right in the deepest part of the recession, uh, I actually chose Southern California schools to apply to, knowing that I would be too close to LA to keep my options open to continue exploring comedy, may it be stand up, sketch, acting, or, or improv. When I got to Southern California, UC Irvine, the first year of a PhD program in economics is a lot of work. We'll just leave it at that. It's a lot of work. So writing and acting just didn't really have time for that. And so what really drew me to improv is I had already put in the work to know the foundations of improv theater. So I just had to show up once a week to practice and then to perform once a month. It wasn't like an ongoing every day having to write, having to you know, iterate your, your ideas for, for the stage. So that's where I got my, my improv uh, inspiration. And I was in a couple of groups there. I helped someone start uh, an improv company out there. I wasn't really involved in any of the business side of things, but this was one of the first members uh, that kind of helped that get off the ground. So I kind of always had in the back of my mind that if I went somewhere and there wasn't uh, an improv theater, that perhaps I would, I would start one. And that probably would have happened if I stayed in Plattsburgh, to be honest, because there, was, there is not an improv theater there. So I would have tried to, to figure that out. Your question about uh, does improv help with entrepreneurship, uh, I think 100%. We do corporate workshops with uh, Happy Valley Improv, and we go into the Entrepreneurial Center here in State College, also worked with a lot of entrepreneurship students at uh, Susquehanna University, really talking about the creativity aspect, what like that's what improv is about. It's about building, it's about saying yes, it's about building on an idea and not knowing where it's gonna go. Uh, but trusting the process that you're, you're going to come out with something that is going to be, you know, valuable talks a lot about failure, you know, in improv, you're doing a ton of stuff off the top of your head and some of it's not going to work and then you're okay with it, right? You can't sit there and be like, oh man, that scene didn't go well, you know, for the last 20, 20 seconds. So now it's going to be awful forever. No, you just wipe it clean and you start something new. Improv helps me with my mindset, you know, being present, handling the unexpected, being able to, to pivot very quickly if there's something going, knowing how to handle that anxiety of like, I don't know what's going to happen, but I just know this needs to happen. Uh, all that stuff on the improv stage, I think, directly related to entrepreneurship. And, and then there's more, that's a little more cerebral, but I think there's presentation, right? You have to be able to project on stage. You have to be able to uh, know how to communicate if you're going to be an actor or anything like that in theater. Obviously, if you're giving presentations or you're pitching, those are all good skills to have. Uh, so I tell all of my students when I used to teach vast, you know, at Penn State, 700 person lecture halls, I would tell everyone they should take theater or improv. I think the skills are so transferable, especially in business. Yeah, I want to fast forward to you teaching at Penn State. And I want to get to you know, where you are teaching full-time there, and then kind of when did you start thinking about what was next, you know, what you wanted to do, and, you know, give me an insight into that process for you. Yeah, so I start teaching at Penn State in the fall of 2014, uh, just a few months after getting married, and again, that first year or two, I'd say the first two years, starting a new job, especially something so different, uh, you know, these, these large lectures of 350 to 750 students in a new area without a lot of support, only knowing a few people, you know, the first two years were really putting the, you know, pedal to the metal and grinding away at, you know, the full-time job, making sure I could do everything uh, the best I could and try and automate processes, try and make sure I can get all the admin down, you know, utilizing the, the Google Forms, all that stuff for TAs, et cetera. And, and yeah, so I'd say for the first couple of years, there really wasn't much thought going on for entrepreneurship in, in general. 
once things start to slow down a little bit, I start, I got, had my feet under me, then the wheels start turning more and more. The first actual entrepreneurship idea I had before we really even started the improv group was my, my wife and I went through an accelerator program for an app. It was a photo app that people would take pictures of other animals and they would then log them in a passport. Uh, it was called Pets I've Met. And the idea was people would go around and they would meet a dog at a tailgate. They'd take a picture of it. They'd ask for its name. They'd get its breed. And then it would go into a feed, like an Instagram feed. People would be like, oh, man, you know, there'd be a heat map. Oh, all these dogs are at this dog park. And then, you know, different maps of where places are pet friendly, all that type of stuff. So that was really my first real dive into like tech entrepreneurship. Uh, at the same exact time, that would be fall of 2016, is when me and three other people here at in-state college, three other adults, so non-students, started meeting regularly and just doing improv without even thinking that it was going to be a business. We just wanted to do improv. Uh, and every, you know, every couple months, something else came up. There was a grant that got us to do a couple of shows. Then there was uh, an introduction to someone who would get us an LLC. And then, you know, six years later, six years later, we have a we have a theater that you know has expenses and insurance and all the all the things. So talk to me about you know what were some of the biggest learning experiences you had. I'm assuming you've never tried to build an app before. You've never gone through an accelerator before. You know I know there's a lot of people out there that you know are looking to start something but are basically starting from scratch. So you know what were some of the big things that you learned and failed at and then succeeded at along the way as well as well. Yeah. I, I learned that it is very important to have either uh, a person who is into computers and tech on your team or a really good uh, company that you are, are working with that can communicate well and that are willing to be as fast as you want to be as a, as a founder. I would always think of all these things I would love to do to test, right? You know, we, we went through... You know, the, the accelerator program I went through was very lean, very, you know, push. If you could push every single day a different thing to test it, that's what we would love to do. I was working with another startup that was developing the app on iOS and Android at the same time through like React Native. And I didn't know anything about it. So it would take, you know, weeks for us to get a new update pushed out. And it took a long time to do the bugs. They quoted us at a very low price of we'll, we'll deliver you a completed project for this fixed amount. And it should have been a red flag early that I, ha I had known from my research, looking at how much something like this would cost that A, they probably shouldn't just give me a fixed amount right away because you never know how long things are going to take. But also it was so much lower that I knew that the work had to have been not as, as complete as, as it would have been. So that was, that's like the biggest thing I, I took away of making sure that relationship with a developer is super strong or have someone on your team and then being okay with like cutting that off right away if it's not going well, because we had to pay like half up front and then 25% halfway and then 25% at the end. And really I, looking back on it, I probably should have just halfway through cut my losses and said, you know what, just give me the code. I'm going to bring it somewhere, somewhere else. That was probably the biggest thing I, I learned. Going through the accelerator process was amazing for me, just learning things as an entrepreneur uh, and having so many resources. I tell people, you know, I probably put in, my wife and I probably put in about $10,000 of our savings into this project. And I got way more than that in return in knowledge. You know, spending money doesn't always need to have an ROI, actual money. Uh, there are things that you may buy and spend on like an education that you're not seeing immediate returns to, but that's okay. Like it might be good to pay hundreds of dollars a month for a marketing consultant, even if your marketing is not bringing you in revenue right away, but you're learning how to do Facebook ads or, or stuff like that. I had a very similar process in terms of a failed app that led to my next business. And something that, you know, I struggled with was like knowing the right time to, you know, give up or cut your losses in, in terms of, that side of it. So I'm curious for you, how did you realize when was the right time to pull the plug and what did that look like? Yeah. At the, uh, at the end of the 15 week accelerator program or 10, 15 weeks or whatever, we did our full pitch and everything. And that was fine. 
And really, it came to you need to we need to really have a good plan on how to make money off of it, right? Um, and did I want to put that amount of work into it? Did I want to be spending a full-time job on this when I was already teaching full-time and really enjoyed my, my job, uh, really enjoyed the improv group that we had been building? Did I want to start allocating 40 to 50 hours a week on this project? Uh, and I really just didn't want to. I wasn't passionate about it. Uh, and so I just didn't see myself going and saying, all right, I need to put a, I need to go out and find every single pet friendly hotel in Pennsylvania. And I need to put it on this list. And then I need to go out to Silicon Valley and, and, and try and raise a couple million dollars. I just, that was not in my DNA at the time for that specific project. So seeing that the improv was going fairly well, my full-time job was going fairly well. And uh, we'd kind of come to a, stalemate with our developers like they had gotten to what i felt like was probably as good of a product as they were going to get to every just everything just seemed to be like all right now it's time to to cut our losses and move on and and at that time i know you have the improv group on the side but are you in the mindset where you are all right i tried this venture it didn't work let me focus on teaching and i'm just going to like enjoy that for now or were you like all right, that didn't work, but let's let's see if we can make the improv group work. Where you know where was your head at there? I think my head my head was at you know we've, we've got this full time job that's paying the bills. Let's try and build this community out in improv. I don't think there's really anything else I, I was quite thinking about at that time. Uh, I really wanted to you know I was still leaning on the entrepreneurship community here in State College. So we were doing corporate trainings and classes and everything with the improv theater. And I was the main business manager. So I was spending a lot of time building that out, building out those assets. And I've always liked having a project on the side. Uh, and then of course, you know, the teaching job, you know, I got to a point probably where I could get away with like 25 hours a week working at Penn state and getting everything I needed to get done. Uh, as long as I wasn't volunteering myself for anything too, too much extra. Uh, so I was just doing those two things and really enjoying life. And I know a lot of people kind of think about the process of quitting and when's the right time to quit. So did you come up with a plan of you wanted to have a certain level of validation or a certain amount of savings or, you know, how did you think about the process from when you decided to quit to when you actually did? Well, so I was on a contract through 2024. So I knew I had a job through 2024 at the very least. They weren't going to let me go. And I knew that uh, I was a good enough worker that I could keep this job at Penn State and a well-paying job, great benefits for as long as I wanted to. In 2021, we, as soon as we were coming out of the depths of the lockdown, we opened up a physical space of a theater. And I knew that that meant I was probably going to need to do 20 hours a week to keep that space running and to be able to pull any sort of money out of it if I was going to get paid from it. So that kind of started the wheels turning of, you know, should I be looking for an out from, from Penn State? And, and at the time, it wasn't really, I was like, okay, well, I can, I can handle everything right now. It's not too bad. But really, ever since like the second year, so ever since like 2018, I just hadn't been completely satisfied with the position that I was in. Loved working with students. I still do. That's why I run an education consulting business. And I love teaching. The department that I was in, you know, the function they were trying to maximize was student happiness and departmental happiness in the sense of if you had a decent distribution and your students didn't complain about you and you got good evals, you were a good teacher. So there was no evaluation on actual learning. There was no reward for actual learning. There was a lot of reward for people who would just pass out candy or show videos in classes. And that really bothered me on a vision of higher education level. So I remember, you know, just a couple months before lockdown, uh, inviting over one of my good friends here in State College who is in uh, student affairs and throwing the idea out to him that I believe in a big university like Penn State, there's a need for one-on-one -on -one coaching and mentoring because a lot of students 
come from maybe smaller areas or they come from a high school that has a lot of support. And then you step on foot at Penn State's campus with 50,000 students and you know 20,000 faculty, staff, and graduate students. And yes, they have a ton of resources, but how do you navigate that confusing world? Right? How do you navigate that world? And is there enough customers in this town that parents and or students would value a couple hundred dollars a week to have someone here that knows everything frontwards and backwards? Is it is it worth you know two to three thousand dollars a semester to keep a student on track so they don't have to retake a semester or they get a lot of bad grades so their GPA ends up falling to a level that you know doesn't get them the internship? Uh, so I remember having that conversation pre lockdown. I mean, I'll say straight up, I'm glad nothing, I didn't do anything pre lockdown. Like it was great. Uh, and I was very privileged to have a job that was stable through the depths of the pandemic. I guess I never asked, oh wait, hold on, I didn't answer your question. <laughs> so then I thought like 2024 is what I would be doing. I ended up developing an online class for Penn State and it was fine, but I didn't like it. I don't like creating content, especially creating content that then they have ownership over. So I had to sign over the IP for like future money. Like I could still use it if I'm teaching a class at the university, but I can't like put it on YouTube and grab uh, ads or anything like that. They wanted me to do that for another class. And I was very annoyed by that because I want to be with students, not in a dark light board room, writing equations on a board. So that was annoying me a little bit. Then the fall of 2021 semester came about uh, and Penn State did not require a vaccine for their students. And, and at first they weren't even going to require a mask. Uh, and I was slotted to teach 750 people in a single room without any windows or any ventilation. Now, I personally was not worried. Uh, I would have been distanced enough and vaccinated. I wasn't worried about my own health. What I was worried about is the president of the university went on town hall and said, if students end up getting COVID, they'll have to isolate for 10 days. And then there is their responsibility to connect with the instructor to then make up any missed work. That's unreasonable in a large class of 750 people, because even if only 10% of my class, or even if only, let's say 5% of my class, right? That's thir over 30 people I'm going to have to work with week by week to get this work done. And I had just taught the same class and developed this class online. So I requested for my department to teach the class virtually, and it was denied. I put all of my reasonings, the pedagogical reasonings, all this stuff out, and my supervisor, direct supervisor, no, we're going back to normal. I then tweeted out that I would be offering my class online or in person because I care about my students' health. That tweet got back to the university and to the dean, and then my, you know, my boss, my department head came to me and said, like, you know, I can't back you up if you're breaking any of the rules. Uh, I said, what rules am I breaking? I'm going to be there in the classroom. I'm just going to live stream it to anybody who wants to take it in my class. Like, what am I doing wrong? And I wasn't doing anything wrong. I could do that whenever I wanted to, as long as I was in the classroom. So it just, I had to go to HR and like, get them to tell me, no, you can do that. Like, there's nothing against you. You don't have to require students to come to class and you can put everything online. That's perfectly fine. As long as I give the option of face-to-face -face. and the way that that was all handled, I was, I was stressed out. I like just felt horrible for the students that, you know, some of their classes were completely in person and then they would be falling behind. And I knew the education gap that was going to occur because of the pandemic. And so I went home. My wife and I discussed a lot of everything. We have no intention of having children. My wife has a good job with benefits. We saved a lot of money during the pandemic. I am very, very privileged in that, in that space. So we took a look at it and said, I don't need to do this anymore. I woke up the next morning and wrote a letter of resignation. Uh, I offered to stay through till June. So I offered to stay a full academic year to help the department out. I said I would I would really like to end on December 31st and then and then if they want me to stay on to teach fully remotely in the spring to as like a handover and then I had a semester to to figure out exactly what was going to happen. I always love to go into, you know, kind of the expectation versus reality of the first year after quitting. I know a lot of people 
you know, I think have these impressions of where where they think the business is going to go, how much they think they're going to make, you know, what things are going to be like. Um, but a lot of times it's a lot harder and there's a lot more road bumps than people expect. You know, what did that look like for you? I didn't have a lot of expectations. So I, I knew that I would be able to teach classes uh, at improv and make, you know, enough money to survive. And really our mortgage and utilities uh, at my house about $2,500 a month. And I told my wife, I can make sure that I can get that. And I knew I could either through consulting stuff or small gigs or, or anything. I'm like, I'll be able to make sure we have a place to live. You got to do everything else. And so we've done better than we've been done better than that. I, you know, obviously we're not going to make close to what I made last year, but we continue to see growth in both the theater and in the tutoring slash coaching business that I'm doing. I have a goal of getting to like a certain number of students this semester, and we're really close to that. The outside like contracting to other people is actually higher than expected. You know, we're, we're I'm doing fine. Uh, I'm also, again, in like such a privileged position than most people that I could step away. I do have health insurance through my wife's work. We're not having children, so I don't have to save for, you know, a, you know, college fund for individuals. Her grandmother passed away about a half decade ago and left us enough money to uh, put down payment on a house. And so our house is continuing to add equity. So we're just in a very, very lucky position to be able to go through this process. I also know with my contacts and the work that I've done up to this point that if I needed to, if, if something were to happen, I could get a full-time teaching job making enough money to support myself and my family, you know, starting in two months. So I have a lot of safety nets, which is uh, not what everybody else has. Uh, but so I, I, I decided I would take that chance. I'm curious in terms of, you know, as you are getting the theater up and running, were you able to use your experiences from your previous two startups in that? Did you take, you know, some of the learnings that you had from that and implement it? And, you know, what were, what were some of those things if so? The same thing I mentioned before about making sure keeping better records of, of customers. Uh, I'm doing a better job, but not a perfect job of that with the theater. So I definitely took that with me. I took also all the resources. Every time you do something, you learn about a new resource. So in Pennsylvania, there's a whole program that's called Invent Penn State. And Invent Penn State gives you free access to legal help for startups. So all of my LLCs, which who knows how many I've had by now, have, you know, been, have gone through that clinic, this uh, entrepreneurship clinic at the launch box at Penn State main campus. So all of our operating agreements, you know, haven't paid a single dime for, for that. Uh, all of our contracts, independent, independent contractor contracts, labor contracts, space usage contracts, all that stuff using those resources has really, really helped out. And then just leveraging networking, like understanding that networking is so hugely important for everything. It doesn't matter if you're trying to build an app or build an improv community or get students to pay you weekly to go over their schedule with you, right? Like you just have to, you have to have a good personal brand out there. Uh, so when someone lets the people know that they have a pain point that someone else knows you can solve, they're going to recommend you. I want to get into a little bit of the work-life balance conversation. I know that's something that a lot of people have different feelings on and a lot of people struggle with, you know, especially with being fully connected at all times. You have multiple businesses now, you know, but now you control your own schedule. So how did you think about how you wanted to set up the businesses that you have with kind of the lifestyle that you want to have? And what does that look like for you? Yeah, it's a good question. I would say at this point, I don't have much of a work-life balance because I've started two things that I really enjoy to do and the relaxation ends up coming in the form of, of work. So I, I teach youth improv on Monday nights. I teach adult improv on Tuesday nights. I'm usually at the theater practicing or performing on Thursday and Friday nights. 
I'm teaching entrepreneurship to undergrads at Susquehanna University's all, all university all day on on Wednesdays. So there's very little time that I'm just sitting down and relaxing. I haven't golfed as much this year. Uh, I'm not watching as much television as maybe I would have before, but I'm okay with that. I'm lucky that my, my wife does all of the tech at the theater. So a lot of the improv stuff, uh, she's kind of by my side for it. I really try a few nights a week to make sure that we're having dinner together and helping out. Uh, and she's in education as well. And obviously my education stuff slower in the summer. So in the summers we get to spend a lot of time together. However, I would say during the, specifically, especially the fall semester when there's like football games on the weekend and, you know, it's a very busy time for us, uh, we don't have a lot of time together. And I, I, I'll see how that goes. Like I, I, like you said, I can, I get to set my schedule and if I need time off, I can take it. I just haven't done that much yet. Yeah, and uh, something I'm curious about, it kind of ties in the improv and business side of it. I think with work going more remote and going more hybrid, it's becoming harder to find community or create community um, in a virtual space. So I'd be curious in terms of, do you see more of a need for communities like improv and things in person? And you know, what's your thoughts in general, just building community virtual? Is it possible to do the same effective way? Or do you think that in-person collaboration is you know, kind of necessary for at least, you know, a hybrid model? I, I think in-person collaboration at some level is necessary just so you have some sort of, it, sort of connection. During, the, during lockdown, we continue to meet as a company, as a community uh, for Happy Valley Improv once a week for an hour on Zoom. We, we, we figured out ways to do improv on Zoom. We did shows, we did classes, and we continued because we knew the important part of our company was the community. We knew that we couldn't just shut down for a year and a half and not do it. And, we, and I know a bunch of improv communities around the country that just kind of shut down and are you know, still not back up to where, where they were beforehand. However, I know a lot of online improv communities where they continue to do shows on Zoom, you know, streaming them to Twitch or to YouTube. And that work, has worked well for, for them too. So I think, you know, having options for individuals, what their comfort level is, uh, is, is important. We've done improv training sessions on Zoom with companies that are trying to build more community, uh, just getting people to feel more vulnerable around each other and laugh around each other. It's much harder to build that trust and community over a Zoom call, but it can be done. It's much better when we get to go into an organization and spend a half day with people and get them performing and get them laying on the ground and doing all the fun theatery things that we do. I would be I would be sad if my entire day was just sitting and having uh, communication and community with people on a screen. But that's me. And I'm sure there are people who are perfectly comfortable with throwing on a Oculus and doing a metaverse thing. And that's their social interactions. I'm sure that would be great for them. I don't know what I would do with it. I was very lucky during the pandemic. Uh, we had a roommate. So my wife and I have a roommate and his, he was working at the radio station, so still had to go in and his girlfriend at the time worked there too. So we kind of had our little pot of four that we would be able to hang out with. I don't know what would have happened if it was just me and my wife. Something I ask every guest on the show is, you know, a lot of people are either looking to quit or have recently quit. And what do you think is the best piece of advice that you were given along the process or you wish you knew before you went through the process? I don't know if it's really advice. I'm very grateful that I had, as I've mentioned before, the safety nets that are there. I don't know if I would have done it if I, if I needed to worry about going into the marketplace and getting health insurance. And if I would have had to, you know, if I had a family to support, and so there were a lot of people like at Penn State who were really frustrated with the university and continue to be frustrated with how the university is handling the pandemic and the education gap that's coming out from it. But honestly, they just can't quit. Like they've got bills to pay. They've got retirements to worry about. I didn't have that. So I was very, 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 very lucky. I think it's, I think a good tip is to go back and see if you have those. It's not good to jump without a parachute. Like sure, you can jump out of a plane and maybe survive, but it's much easier if you have a parachute. <laughs> so is there a backup uh, plan if things uh, go south? 
you know, I think maybe if I could have done it, if I could have done it differently, I might have tried to be a little more, like not burn the bridge as much as I burnt it. But I just was doing what I really need to do at the time. You know, because maybe I want to leave that door open for the future. And like now it's definitely shut. But yeah, like, you know, if, if, if the plan lines up, go for it. But I tell my I tell my students, I tell my undergraduate students, like now's the perfect time to like try something new. You have so many safety nets. You know, you'd rather start a business and have it fail when you're 22 versus when you're when you're 32 or 42. Not that people don't do it, but it just makes it a lot easier. Maybe that's the e- economist in me talking about risk aversion. No, I mean, uh, I'm I'm same way. I think uh, to a fault, I think I play a worst case scenario to uh, most of the decisions that I make. And, yeah. you know, it's really, you know, what's what's the worst case scenario and what are your fallback options? So mm-hmm. I, I definitely kind of resonate with what you're talking about there. And, you know, to end it, I ask uh, everyone the same question as well. Over the next three to five years, what are you most excited about? And that could be, you know, the consulting business, the theater, something personal, but like what gets you most excited over the next three to five years? Besides driverless cars, so that way I don't have to waste time <laughs> driving my myself around places. I, I'm most excited about the tutoring and coaching business, getting to a point where I'm able to kind of take a little bit of a step back and I have other people who are doing it and I've built a machine that's well oiled and I'm kind of on the, I'm making the money and making the decisions and doing the overarching strategy, but I'm not necessarily having to be one-on-one with students, kind of allocating my time a little better. I'm excited for that. I think it's going to get there. For the theater, I just want to continue to see it grow. I My goal has always been that when someone new moves to state college and they ask someone like, oh, what do I do here? I want one of the first things out of their mouths to be you go to the Blue Brick Theater and see Happy Valley Improv on Friday nights. And I want I want that statement to be up there with, oh, you better go to a football game and you got to go to the Arboretum and you got to go to the Creamery. I want go to a Happy Valley Improv show because it's so much fun and it brings so much joy to the community. That's That's what I'm excited about. I love it. That sounds great. Well, I'm excited to uh, follow along and see how that goes and really appreciate your time and you coming on. Oh, thanks for having me. And, you know, I'll come back every single day if you need me to. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you for listening. It really means a lot to us. We want to hear from you as we keep growing. Please reach out on whyquit.co if you have any feedback or potential guests. A special thanks to Chris Dole for the music. Please check out his newest album, Here's to You, on Spotify. Thank you, and we will be back next week with another episode.